Hello and welcome to the Source of Life podcast, a podcast on water history in the ancient and medieval Middle East. We see the remains of aqueducts all over the Middle East and North Africa today. The Romans constructed aqueducts in cities like Caesarea in today's Israel, in Gadara, which is today's Umm Qais in Jordan, and at Zahwan in Tunisia. Aqueducts continued to be constructed in the Islamic era by the Umayyads in Ramla and the Abbasids in Baghdad, for example, and we will discuss some of these in our episode on Baghdad. But today we will be talking about the longest aqueduct of the ancient world, the Valens Aqueduct in Constantinople, today's Istanbul. Sections of the aqueduct still survive as a gateway into central Istanbul, and thousands of Istanbulus pass through its imposing arches every day. Joining me to discuss this is Dr. Mariette Verhoeven from Radboud University in Nijmegen. Mariette is a lecturer in the Department of History, Art History and Classics and a researcher specialising in the field of late antique and Byzantine cultural and architectural history and heritage. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Anne. So just to get into this subject, first I'd like to know a little about how you first became interested in this topic. What drew you to it? I have been researching the what we call the longer durée, so the, the, the long lines of history of Byzantine heritage in Istanbul for many years. And then in 2020, I was asked by the Dutch Institute in Turkey to participate uh, in a small project uh, which was titled Cultural Heritage Techniques for Sustainable City, uh, that was looking for solutions um, for employing heritage for sustainability issues. And we, we were a group of mainly Turkish and Dutch uh, researchers, decided that water heritage lent itself the most to tackle these issues. Uh, We saw for the most defining factor maybe for uh, Istanbul through the ages and we decided water was what we should concentrate on because normally I concentrate also a a lot on religious heritage but that's it's in many cases contested heritage and water heritage is not or less so um and it is multi-layered it has a uh, it's, it's, it's also uh typical for longer durée up until now and that's where i started to investigate mainly the byzantine history of this water heritage so as a new line of research and then in 2022 I acquired a fellowship from NWO, um, for which I stayed in Istanbul uh, for three months to do further research. And there I focused mainly on the Valens Aqueduct. NWO is the Dutch government uh, funding agency, right, for academics? Yes. Um, And so what does it look like now? Just can you give us some orientation about um, the aqueduct as it stands in the city of Istanbul today? Where is it? What does it look like? How much of it is left? Yeah, so uh, the Valens Aqueduct, as it is called, is actually a aqueduct bridge crossing two hills on the ancient peninsula in Istanbul, so I can say it's at the heart of the ancient city, um, as it was founded by uh, Constantine and then extended later, and it's 971 meters long, with a small part that doesn't exist any more within this 971 meters, um, uh, but it is all that remains in this in the city in the old city of this much longer system called the Valens Line. 
So when I'm talking about the Valence Aqueduct, I'm talking of this heritage object, this imposing structure that is still standing in today's Istanbul as the major remain of the Valence Line, which was a system of tunnels and bridges and pipelines that came from outside the city. Uh, and that was uh, built in the fourth century under violence. Maybe we come back to that uh, uh, later. And that was extended in the fifth century. So, so what you see today, this imposing series of arches, the sort of there as you come into the old city, right? If you're coming from the airport, you you even drive through them, right? Yeah, many. I think. Every inhabitant of Istanbul knows this object, not only because it's so large, but also because they drive through it, because uh, its former function, that of water supply, was lost. So it's not in use anymore, but it's now functioning as a passageway uh, uh, through the ancient city. So everyone... Uh, passes this object some daily and some maybe monthly but everyone crosses it yeah and you mentioned it's an aqueduct bridge this visible existing part uh could you just tell me what is the difference between an aqueduct and an aqueduct bridge it becomes a bridge when you have to span uh for example two hills James Quar, who did a lot of research on the water supply of Constantinople, he told me that it wasn't actually necessary to build such a large bridge. So it was also a statement of the emperor. So it was also to impress to build uh, such a, a large above-ground structure. That's interesting. So where today we might build skyscrapers or opera houses or something like that as a visible expression of our culture, there the, there's a link between prestige projects and the water heritage. Yeah. Maybe for the ones who don't know the city, Istanbul, like Rome, consists of seven hills. So the Valence Aqueduct Bridge spans between two hills of the seven uh, hills. That's what mainly remains of the ancient aqueducts are these imposing structures. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think for many people, when they hear the word aqueduct, they just think of an aqueduct bridge. That for them, um, aqueduct bridge is an aqueduct, but that's there are many less uh, impressive aqueducts, which are just maybe a, a brick-lined channel or a pipe or something like that. That's um, that's also an aqueduct. It doesn't have to be one of these big uh, arch structures like the Pont du Gard in France or the, the Valens Aqueduct in Istanbul. Let's move on to a bit more about the, the history. Could you give us a short overview of the aqueduct's history? You've, you've mentioned that it was named after the Emperor Valens. Was he fully responsible for the aqueduct? Was there something there beforehand? Uh, and how much was added? So you mentioned there was an extension in the 5th century. How much is Valens responsible for what we see or later editions? The Emperor Valens reigned from 364 to 378. And it was the statesman and philosopher Timistius who tell us in his oration for the Emperor Valens, so in the 4th century, that the city became alive only when the emperor brought water to it. So uh, there you see a clear mention of Valens being responsible. Jerome, another source in his chronicle, he credited the city prefect uh, Cleachus with bringing water to the city in the year 373. So he mentions a specific day. And this uh, Cleachus, he was prefect under, uh, temi- uh, sorry, under Valens. And so most historians um, hold 373 
as the date for the uh, completion of uh, the long distance water supply system. So for the complete line. So this line of channels, bridges, tunnels carry water through the landscape. And um, that line was 185 kilometers long. We know from uh, sources which mention the length of it in states. 1,000 states, and that's about 185 kilometers long. But that was not the first aqueduct or system to have been built. We know that, again, from sources, that an earlier aqueduct system, so an earlier line, was constructed for the city of Byzantium by the emperor Hadrian in the second century. Hadrian reigned from 117 until 138. So that was in Roman times. Um, some people, some like historians, we now don't do that anymore. We um, said that Constantine built a complete new city when he founded the city of Constantinople in three. 24. Uh, but that is not the case. There was already uh, in Roman times a city, um, not as uh, uh, large or famous as um, the Constantinian city to become, but actually um, Constantine extended the Roman city as it was when he founded his new city. And of course, the main difference was that it now also became a Christian uh, city under Constantine. But Constantine knew Roman cities. His example were Roman cities, and with the most important one, Rome. So that was also uh, the plan he used for his city. So, which in the beginning was also filled with with pagan temples and objects and. Uh, so, yeah, there was an older line, and it was the, uh, the line of Hadrian, and that also was used still in Byzantine times and uh, also even later. So the Hadrian system, was it, um, was it joined to the Valen system, or are these two separate systems? There were two lines. So the Hadrian line was used for the lower parts of the city. So where now Hagia Sophia, where the Acropolis was, where the palace was, where, so actually where the city of Septimius Severus was, who actually after Hadrian founded a, um, his Roman city. And the Valens line was then needed when after Constantine found the city, he enlarged it as well, building a new wall much farther to the west. And for this greater city, with also much more people, uh, this Valens line was created. And this Valens line was then supplemented in the 5th century under what we call the Theodosian emperors, with an extension of 65 kilometers of uh, tunnels and bridges, uh, so that made it from a 185 kilometers line to 250 in a straight line. But James Quar and others calculated that the line, because it was not straight, of course, uh, was at least in total 425 kilometers long. It went all the way up uh, to the what is now the Bulgarian uh, border. So 250 kilometers as the crow flies, but uh, 420 kilometers with all the loops and kinks and ups and downs. Yes, indeed. Um, so what kind of sources then were the, was this drawing on? Was it uh, many different little springs or sources or, or was it one major source? Do we know? Yeah, um, so for the Hadrianic line, the springs were located in what's 
called the Forest of Belgrade. <laughs> um, so that's now like more or less within the city center, I would say. So it's, it's above the Bosphorus at that time, of course, well out of the city, but still not too far. And then the Valens line, as celebrated by Themistius, who I mentioned at the beginning, his oration for Valens, was springs at places called Damandura and Penarcha, now in Turkey, at a distance of this thousand state I mentioned. And then the extension was near Visa, and Visa is further uh, up in Trace, and not too far from the Bulgarian uh, uh, border. Uh, so that are the springs, the sources that are mentioned. So they are really major springs. Right. So, so that and and you say the Hadrianic uh, line then took the springs from quite uh, near to the city, quite close to the city. So that makes sense to me that um, you, if you build a city, you would bring your water sources from close by. Indeed, you would build your city somewhere with springs nearby that you could bring in relatively easily. But for this hugely extended 185 kilometers for the Valens and then uh, 420 kilometers for the, the extension, it's a huge amount of trouble to go to. Why, why bother? Why was this aqueduct built? What was the point? Yeah, so it was in part, uh, so the city's growing population, because after, so from the time of, of Constantine on, but especially in the fifth uh, uh, century, and also in part by the increased threat of hostile uh, attacks. And so, because the system didn't just consist of tunnels and bridges and pipelines, but also uh, of open, in the fifth century, huge open reservoirs were uh, created within the walls, mainly for agricultural uh, purposes. And then there would have been closed system for uh, drinking water, uh, but these huge reservoirs were also a kind of reserve for the times when, uh, times of war or, or other calamities. But indeed, it was a huge effort, and also from the perspective of maintenance, and actually very soon after the 5th century, uh, this, 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 this extension of, of 425 kilometers would not have been uh, necessary anymore. So the the city has a history of growing and then declining population and yeah, as uh, elsewhere, all things uh, kind of things happen. So it seems that also this effort was not only I should I say it huge in terms of of labor and expenses, but also for a rather short time because in 629 Avars siege the city and and then the line was was broken um also later restored but at that time for a very long period it was not in use anymore well let's uh, go on to that in fact so how was it ma maintained what what is the history of maintenance of the of the aqueduct and and who did this whose responsibility was it we know that in the fifth century under the empress theodosia the first and arcadius uh, there were seven laws specifically concerned with the regulation of water distribution and the provision of the uh, maintenance of the aqueducts, both in and outside. And from these laws, we know that the diameter of the pipe uh, supplying a property was determined by the size of the estate and whether it had baths. So that would be a law for the elite, of course. Then we know that all taxpayers were liable to contribute labor and materials for repair of the system. And we know that there were extreme penalties for diverting water for irrigation, 
and for taking water from an aqueduct, water than from a reservoir. So the reservoirs, uh, from there, uh, you could apparently um, take water more easily as well for the for the aqueducts it was uh, um, regulated and this was free right they, you didn't have to pay for the water or did you was there some kind of fee that you would pay to 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 get this water for drinking james core says that in constantinople uh, water was a right people so uh, yeah it was not uh, a um, luxury, or uh, so it seems to have been free, as long as you used it in a proper in a proper uh, uh, way. As for maintenance, Procopius, the, our main source for the reign of Justinian, the sixth century emperor, in a secret history, which was not an official history, uh, as the title suggests accused the emperor Justinian of willful ne neglect and stinginess when the city's aqueduct broke and remained unrepaired, um, suggesting so that, that Justinian did, did, didn't do anything uh, uh, for the maintenance of the aqueduct. But there were only two occasions in the history uh, of this violence line, so for the for the for the systems uh, in Byzantine times, that the supply was cut. That was in 487 during a revolt against the Emperor Zeno, and then the most important one in uh, 626, uh, when a large Avar army. I already mentioned that besieged the city from the Thracian hinterland. And we have a source, Theophanes, um, uh, who reports that the aqueduct of violence was cut, not to be restored until the reign of Constantine V in 766. So almost 150 years, the violence line would not have been uh, in use. And that meant that in that time, only the Hadrianic line, so only the system that was already there since the second century, would have been in use and apparently would have been enough. And, but that would also mean that in this period, this large system uh, would have been needed also for other purposes than agriculture and that also the smaller systems, which would also have collected rainwater, uh, would have been in use to uh, supply the city uh, uh, with enough uh, water. Interestingly enough, the water supply does not figure in later uh, sieges, such as that of 1204 and 1453. So uh, this the mention of this um, event in 626 um, uh, also are fullest evidence for the water supply uh, in the sources and there we also know about the organization of the work of the renovation of, of the system and I will quote from Theophanes um, it's a chronicle for the year 765-66 there ensued a dwarf, such that even dew did not fall from heaven, and water entirely disappeared from the city. Cisterns and baths were put out of commission. Even those springs that in former times had gushed continuously now failed. On seeing this, the emperor, Constantine V, set about restoring Valentinian's sick aqueduct which had functioned until Heraclius and had been destroyed by the Avar. He collected artisans from different places and brought from Asia and Pontus, 1,000 masons and 200 plasterers, from Hellas and the islands, 200 clay workers, and from Trace itself, 5,000 5, laborers and 200 brickmakers. 
He set taskmasters over them, including one of the petitioners. When the work had been completed, water flowed into the city. So that is what we know about this re restoration and reconstruction. And so he mentioned mason plasterers, clay workers, brick makers. And that brings me to another point that we uh, don't have archaeological evidence and also not much in the sources about uh, lead pipe as where in Rome we have them and in Pompeii have them all over the place. Well, and all the better for the inhabitants of Constantinople that they didn't have to have water lead poisoning uh, in their water supply. That's really interesting. And I so the, this I'm assuming that when we have the the break the water system breaking down that there's well you you gave hints of it in this description of the empty cisterns and the great um, suffering I guess that that would have created and as, I'm assuming that the this has an impact on population and industry and agriculture that everything contracts if you have the a lack of water supply and and that people leave they go and stay with their relatives in the countryside or something like that that, that the whole city just becomes smaller and less successful to go a little bit further in time we know that in the early 15th century um the valence aqueducts so the part of the system within the city walls still carried water. So this longer line would have been broken uh, long before. Uh, and that this water was used in garden and uh, in gardens may, mainly and orchards. And um, so a section at least was still operating, uh, but then more limited. Uh, because at the time of its, the city's fall in 1453, the population had declined to 70,000 uh, people. Yeah, estimates of inhabitants are always tricky <laughs> and, and, and difficult. Uh, some historians estimate the population of Istanbul, uh, Constantinople at its height up to a million people, but others say no, no, no. It wouldn't have never been more than. Uh, 400, 500,000 people or even less. So, but there was a decline, of course. And, but then when Sultan Mehmed II conquered Constantinople in 1453, according to his biographer, the Sultan ordered the old Byzantine uh, system to be uh, restored. So, and this biographer to Sun Bay, he does not specify where the work took place, um, although he is aware that when the city flourished under the Byzantines, water had been brought in from a distance of, of six or seven days. So they knew that it came from far and um, already in, a, in the 10th century, an Arab source says the water came from Bulgaria. So that was what became like the legend that the, the water came from Bulgaria. Uh, Mehmet, the conqueror, mainly repaired the part of the system that was known as the Hadrianic line, but including the uh, aqueduct bridge uh, of Valens uh, as it stands uh, uh, now. But not this system that was going 185 kilometers. No, not along. So and, and now today still this. So as I said, the Hadrianic line got this water from the forest of Belgrade. That still where a part of the water for, of today's city comes from. Um, so still collecting water in large uh, reservoirs. Uh, uh, is still uh, what uh, Iski, the, the the company responsible uh, for the water supply uh, in Istanbul, is doing. Although now also 
50% of today's water comes from outside uh, the city, from the uh, from other provinces, which is also causing a problem. Yeah, but he was very well aware, as a poet, to maybe mention in whose footsteps he was stepping. And and that it was Constantine who founded the city, and so for example, and and for example, taking the Hagia Sophia into into use, uh, he was very well aware of uh, about what he was doing, and in relation to the water system, he also monumentalized the part he restored by. Um, uh, creating what is called 40 fountains, so monumental fountains uh, very near to the aqueduct bridge. So, as I mentioned, uh, uh, building an aqueduct bridge or uh, monumentalizing water structures also was a way um, to legitimate uh, legitimize uh, your rulerships, apparently, not only through the building of mosques or churches or otherwise. It's interesting to me that uh, Sultan Mehmet comes in and one of the, one of his initial decisions is to, or initial, I don't know, but one of his decisions is, is to focus on this water supply because he is now creating a new capital, I guess. It, uh, eventually, Istanbul becomes the capital of the Ottomans. And, yeah, yeah, but he was very well aware, as a poet, to maybe mention in whose footsteps he was stepping, and and that it was Constantine who founded the city, and so, for example, and and for example, taking the Hagia Sophia into into use, uh, he was very well aware of uh, about what he was doing, and in relation to the water system, he also monumentalized the part he restored by creating what is called 40 fountains, so monumental fountains uh, very near to the aqueduct bridge. So, as I mentioned, uh, uh, building an aqueduct bridge or uh, monumentalizing water structures also was a way to legitimize uh, your rulership, yeah. apparently. Not only through the building of mosques or churches or otherwise. And by that time, the Ottomans had already been uh, a dynasty established in yeah. Anatolia for a couple of centuries. So they would have had yeah, for Byzantine infrastructure all around them, Byzantine and then uh, the, whatever maintenance was going on. So it wouldn't have been strange to him, this kind of built environment. So, Mariette, was uh, was co- the site of Constantinople a good site for a city to be built? Before I got into water heritage, I always thought so. So I was telling my students about the location on this peninsula surrounded by, uh, by the sea, and it was... To- strategically a, a very good location, but actually it, it maybe it was from that point of view, but not from the point of view of water supply, because it lacked fresh water from the beginning. So uh, in that sense, Constantine could have chosen a, a, a better a better place. So that makes uh, it also logical that uh, also, Mehmet II had to do something <laughs> as for uh, solving, because also he repopulated, of course, the city after the uh, the decline. That decline already started, of course, with the crusade of 1204. The, the city never recovered after that. But then uh, in Ottoman times, the, the city was repopulated again, and that meant also uh, the restoration and new water supply structures. And the Ottoman city became full, for example, of fountains, not only connected to mosques, but also public fountains. And public fountains also, of course, are a Roman thing. Uh, so that was also, so these public fountains, although not as many and not as maybe imposing as the ones in Rome, was also where the people could get water from. 
And there's also like a long line to Ottoman times where the small fountains connected to mosques where you get could get your water from. And how unique or representative would is is the aqueduct um, in the context of late antique and medieval waterworks? Is this a really unique structure or is this quite similar to other things we see elsewhere? Well, the aqueduct bridge in itself is, is not unique, but the, the, the system at this height is unique. And it is rightfully called the longest Roman water supply line and that it walks. So the system, let's say 400 kilometers line of tunnels, channels, uh, bridges was was unique. So what the Byzantines did there, you cannot compare it with anything anywhere else. And the so the Valens Aqueduct fell out of use. Was the Hadrianic system continuous? I, I guess there was there a break in supply as we see from from after the Avars siege. Or what we know is that. Uh, it was mainly that part that was restored by Mehmed uh, II. So that proves that it was still there and probably in a rather good state. I think in the end it was uh, the system where the city always uh, uh, fell back to when this, this, this second, this, this long line was not functioning. So in that sense, you could say it was maybe the major system. Yeah. Let's just um, end up to to talk a little bit about the the modern situation. You said you work with uh, water heritage and thinking about the relevance of these sort of ancient systems for thinking about water and sustainability today. So uh, what is the situation with water provision in the city today? Are these um, historical remnants used? Is there any of the ancient system integrated into the modern system, or are these really more symbolic um, artifacts? Yes. So well, when we decided to to work on the Valence Aqueduct in relation to sustainability issues and cultural heritage issues. We choose this object because of its visibility in the city. Everyone knows it, but does everyone know its use? It's actually the biggest remain of ancient times, apart from uh, Hagia Sophia. So we started with a, a small survey uh, amongst inhabitants and also tourists visiting uh, Turkey. It was an online uh, survey and actually people know about its use and function and also think that it should be preserved. And that's also the case uh, with other water heritage objects, not only from Byzantine times, but also Ottoman times. They are not used anymore, apart from found. Many Ottoman fountains uh, as I already said, can be found in the city, and a part of them recently have to have be taken into use again. And of course, fountains uh, near mosques and also ablution fountains in mosques are, are still in use. But with the Valence Aqueduct, we think uh, that we can use this huge object to learn about water supply in the past, in the present, and maybe also in the in the future. Because today, as I said, 50% from Istanbul's water supply come from outside the city, and then I mean from rather far away. And the water supply is also not visible. So people turn the tap and water comes out. That's also not, it's not always drinkable water. So apart from water from the tap, the use of plastic bottles is is gigantic in, in, in Turkey and in, in Istanbul. But anyway, people don't see where the water is coming from and how much effort is put into this water supply. 
every day 60 million, maybe 20 million people have to be supplied with fresh water in one way or another. So we thought, how then can we use this object to increase knowledge about water supply uh, for today? So and we see there a technological solution and a more physical. And what we want to do is to develop a walking route app, so a digital solution, an app which uses text, images, and videos to guide the user along the Valens Aqueduct and related heritage, because in the neighborhoods there are many other water heritage objects from different time periods. So providing not only insight into its multi-layered history, but also contemporary testimonies about water use and knowledge. We also organized an academic course for students and junior professionals from the Netherlands and Turkey last uh, autumn and winter 2022. And also these students uh, got uh, the assignment to come up with solution to use, to take this aqueduct in one way or another into use again. They said so they came up with William plans for collecting rainwater on top of the aqueduct or to use laser to really bring the water virtually back to the aqueduct or to use the aqueduct as the backstage of a water festival, also involving people living in the surrounding because you have really people who when they open up their apartment window, the aqueduct is just like two meters away uh, from it. So that's also engagement. But how do these people then think about this object in uh, just really into their face? And would they be interested in taking this aqueduct, not literally, but to take it in, into use again? Our next step would be to convince stakeholders to do more with this object, which has been by the way, restored in the last years. But this restoration concentrates mainly on yeah, reinforcing the building, so the classical restoration. But there are parts of, of the aqueduct where people are living and its arches are used as cafe. There's a Valence cafe, which is good to see that they at least are aware where they where the cafe is uh, <laughs> located in or or next to but um yeah how can we make more connection between what's going on in and around it and and its former use and what can we then learn from it for the future and the least we can do i think is making people aware of what that water supply is really a big task and this ancient system is is, is a good example of, of how many effort was put into into water supply in the past and and that it is not a thing to take for granted uh, for now or in the future people are very aware of about water supply and shortage in the city it's always an issue that comes up when there's no rain in summer people say or oh, in winter especially people say oh now we will have a problem in summer because we don't have uh, enough water in the reservoirs you can see check every day how much water is in these reservoirs so iski publishes the figures every day and people are very aware of, of that so there is a potential interest then. And do you find that people are interested, the students and in, in the survey that you took, uh, is there an interest in the... In yeah, so in the service, they really think the aqueduct should be preserved. So knowledge about heritage is also really an issue in, in, in Turkey because it's not in a curriculum. Their education is really an issue. It's also one of the sustainable development goals of UNESCO, of course. So we also see there a task to educate people, uh, also professionals in, in, in cultural heritage and, and in how you can use heritage for 
creating awareness and also creating awareness for this multi-layered past. So for me, that's very important. So um, it's, yeah, you see there and in other places, the long lines of history, which make uh, uh, Constantinople also um, not unique, of course. Also Rome has this multi, has also a palimpsest, but, but here you have this major break in history to actually, with the Crusaders in the, in the 13th century, but also this break in religion in the 15th century, still you see so much continuity. And to make people aware of that is really, yeah, I see it as a sort of a task. And uh, people are open to it. The students, they were from the Netherlands and Turkey, as I said, mainly, but there was also someone from Bangladesh, also uh, very aware of, of issues uh, concerning uh, water, water supply, fresh water. And yeah, they were not aware of, they didn't have much knowledge about the history when they started. And then they saw all these possibilities. So it was really great to see also how they saw the possibilities. And for them, mainly also for the Turkish student, so inclusivity, involving people, inhabitants, people in the surroundings um, was a major issue. And I think, yeah, we should not forget about that. So not only uh, come up with uh, plans from above, but really also uh, bottom up, involving people, otherwise it will not work. Yeah, thank you. Well, we, it's been a really fascinating conversation and I, I've, I've learned a lot in the course of this uh, discussion. It was a great opportunity for me to talk about my research and uh, about the project I'm involved in in Istanbul, where I always uh, love to come back. <laughs> thank you very much for being with us. Really, really interesting. That's all from us now. Thanks for listening. 